The other student. Yeah. And where is the guy from multimedia that is supposed to verify that this time it works? Ah, it's a you misquoted yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Six dB yeah. for the quantum illumination. No, this is famous. This is famous six dB of one. So he said three. No, it's a different paper. Yeah, it's, a different paper. Three three paper. it's in his paper. No, the six dB of famous. It's in his paper. <laughs> Your, uh, the one you sent us today. Yeah. But I don't. But I don't. The GHZ with some corruption. But that's not. That's not a problem. No. He's speaking on something else. Yeah. See. Yeah, listen, listen to the guy from a lot. Listen to. But the also in his paper, he laughs. You know, the, the coherent laughs. state wins only the after six dB attenuation. Yeah. In my paper, it's three. No. Six. 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 It's GHZ like until three. Then it becomes M and M. And it's six, and it's six. I read, I read your paper. And it's six, it dies. It dies like, it may, oh, like very sharply. It's a nice paper, though. And we use the quantum camera rub out, so you can't say, oh, I had to switch to some fancy detection scheme. I can do better. No. I'm going to talk about it today. This is the end of yesterday. I thought, let's do that. What I'm going to do is... The, this is supposed to be universal, but the, it doesn't have Israeli and we need to find the cable. Where's the cable? Was the, the bad VGA cable? With the, yeah, yeah. The it's, so it's, so it's so bad. It's so bad that it's still here. <laughs> and, and no, it, no one would ever steal it. After we steal it, you have to bend it. Let me try. No, no, I need to ask you to do it. I love this stuff. A guy has the magic. A guy, we have to hurry. And then every three feet, we run in. We run into somebody. He has to talk. To so we do a random walk. We run the random walk. From Russia, we were from March to here. An incoherent walk. An incoherent we were supposed to leave at 3.30. Uh, we left at 3.40. And then we waited 10 minutes for Eti to stop. Why do you have to wait for Eti? I want to see, I have to get paid. Alicia wants to go to It goes one way, but not the other. Let me press the button there. There you go. Hey, why is it not coming out? Because it's a guy on board. And electric. No, he's cut out. And electric. Now he just banged his knees. Now he can't run any marathon ever again. They bring the news.
We were to Why are you? And now it just works. See? I don't even have to twist. Where do you where, where do you plug it in? I, which side? I mean, this. It was in. Yeah, it was in. <laughs> Two famous experimentalists are fighting over you my know, adapter. You know the, 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 the old guys in the Muppet show? The ones that sit up and they sit down in it? Yeah. So that's me and the Yeah, 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 exactly. Is that what you're doing? What did you do with my bag of stuff? It's over there. Ah. Oh, don't touch the cable. Because we, because we, we complain so much, it's now, now, course. The, now there is a course <laughs> defined in the system. <laughs> quantum so information technology. So press oh my god. Get out it's quantum information technology. So press record and get out of the way. Yeah. I think it's recording already. I shouldn't touch it. So don't touch it. I think it's already recording. Okay. You said that. Because they set it up after I complained to my Check if they set it up in the other classroom. Yeah, the other classroom. No, in the other classroom, there's no way to verify it because there's only two the buttons. But there's, no, there's no, nothing on the computer. Okay, to go. Here we go. Oh, no, you're touching the cable. Ah, don't touch the cable. Now it's good. I have the remote. Okay. Just go to the. Welcome to lecture three. I'm too loud. I, I want to witness this state that, that Professor Katz just shushed me because I was being too loud. I was shushing the rest of Oh, you're shushing the rest of I like standing here. If I stand here, I'm going to fall because I will go low. Hold on. All right. Nice to see some, you move from the back. Up. Yeah. So just for you guys, I decided this, this whole lecture is going to be on super resolution. So last time we discussed super sensitivity, and now we want to know what is the difference. And I, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. Uh, Thursday of next week, Barack Diane and Avek Pair and all these people from different universities said, your last lecture should be an overview of the previous five lectures, which seems unfair to the people who actually showed up because they are not here. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to give uh, the Thursday lecture, it'll be a new lecture, but since they never showed up, they won't realize it is not an overview. <laughs> I'm going to put the networks of quantum sensors last, and then this stuff I think is more important. It's a little bit of math, but not too much. Uh, how you actually calculate these things and so forth. So, but I want to talk a little bit about the connection, the Rosetta Stone is the connection between quantum computing, quantum imaging, quantum sensing, all of these things. All right, and we've been mostly doing optics. I want to talk a little bit about the clocks, uh, spin-based uh, uh, quantum sensors, which are more like qubits. So that'll come, back. I'm not exactly sure what order, but. This one will probably be last. This will be on uh, Monday, and some combination of this will be on Sunday. Okay. And everybody knows this. Ah. Remember I promised you the data? Remember I was missing a data slide? Okay. So there's the data slide from the first experiment with the low noon state. It's in the polarization basis. But remember we had some discussion, I can always take the polarization noon state and trivially, where's Lior? Trivially, trivially, converted into spatial or back again using simple linear optical devices, okay? So even though I write it to 002, it's actually HH plus VV or something like this in the polarization cases. So that's why you don't see the Mach Zender because the Mach Zender is in the polarization. But nevertheless, this is the 1998. Okay, so there's the standard quantum limit, which I told you, you should spank the guy who says this, uh, Kuzmich is still alive, but uh, it's only the standard quantum limit in some regimes, so shot noise limit is the correct. There's the standard quantum limit. This is the one over square root of n improvement, where n is two, so anything below the purple line is super sensitivity. Okay, first experiment. 
And then I can talk about a few more. Where is Kefir? Kefir? Kefir. Kefir? 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 No, no. He's not here. Huh? Mm -hmm. Good, then I can say whatever I want. So Kefir said, but this only works for like some small number of photons. So the sales pitch is that, well, let's suppose you have some protein or some bacteria or an amoeba or some virus, and you want to image it, but if you shine a bright light on it, it will kill it. Okay? So, but you want to get good resolution at low illumination, so this is the marketing is that we can use the entangled photons to get either better sensitivity or better resolution with lower power and not kill the bacteria that we're trying to, to image. Okay. So this is an experiment, this is the O'Brien group, and uh, this is a super sensitivity, they're actually below the shot noise here, it's a two photon device, here's your Mach Zender, all integrated on a chip, and they put in one arm, the phase shift is some concentration of protein molecules, right? So as you increase the protein molecule concentration, the index of refraction in the cell changes very slightly, and that's your phase shift. So you can see here's the concentration of some function of uh, normalized, I don't, can't even read that, normalized signal. Okay. Single, I think. Si si yes, because the other one is normalized. Oh, normalized signal. signals, okay, okay, fine. So this is the unentangled one, and this, you remember the entangled one oscillates two times as fast, and then you plug in the, uh, uh, the delta phi and so forth and you get the uh, uh, square root of two improvement in measuring this at low light. And you also, well, I'll, I'll talk about it. But just keep in mind, the bigger the N, right, the higher the noon state, the more wiggles. We talked about that on Monday. Seems like only yesterday. Okay, and here are a couple of other cool experiments. So, um, this one, so in microscopy, they have something called phase contrast microscopy. Who here knows what that is? One, cuts. Please come and explain on the board what it is. No, 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 no. Stay, stay, stay. You, you want to? Please don't. You can go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, so no, he was not serious. Uh, uh, was I was not, but uh, uh, this gives me a chance to think about what I will do next. Okay. Because if, if I explain it, you will say your explanation is totally wrong. Well. Now I can say his and stuff. Let oh, me so it. let me just adjust the light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so suppose you have something which is uh, transparent, but it creates a phase uh, um, gradient on the uh, light going through it, and you'd like to image this. So uh, there's a few ways to do it. And uh, uh, they all involve. You should just take my lecture. They all involve basically uh, putting a lens, going to a Fourier plane of this, and then uh, there's a few options. Uh, the common one, for example, if you recall, so this thing it can be viewed. The light that comes off after this can be viewed as a bunch of different plane waves together. And actually what you would like to do is to, at the focus here, you put a plate a pi phase shift. which creates yeah. a pi phase shift on the DC component. So now all the other light, which most of the light is focused down here, but some fraction of it is also going here and here. And the light that goes through this component is now going to interfere with the rest. And when you look at the other side, uh, at the image, you're going to see a very high contrast image in which these components now have a different phase, a distinctly different phase from that, and is very easily seen. Now, the reason I know this is because I did a doctorate with phase contrast imaging on bosons and comets. So, so the, but the point is, if you Google phase contrast imaging, you'll see that when you look through the microscope and there is no amoeba or anything like this, it's totally dark, right? Black. Then the amoeba swims through. And the amoeba is the phase shifter, and then suddenly you begin to see the amoeba, but the insides of the amoeba and the, you know, the, the cells and so forth. So this is a standard procedure that people use in microscopy. Sure. And the nice thing about it is that instead of being regular microscopy where I'm making an image, it's, well, I am making an image, but I'm using the phase shift. And so if I have a means to measure a phase shift better, I, which I have just explained for the previous two lectures, then I can use that to image the thing better. 
So that's the idea. There's the there's the phase shift of the amoeba. Uh, I don't. Uh, they have plate as the pi phase shift. I don't know. Okay, but something like this. And then they used noon state two zero zero two noon state. Okay, versus regular laser. And if you steer class uh, steer at this uh, hard enough at this resolution, this one is a, a factor of square root two better image than this guy. Okay, so proof of principle, if I had higher noon states, I could do this even better. And you can see that the fringes are sharp, slightly sharper. Square root of two is not a big deal, but a well, LIGO factor of two is a big deal. This gives you better resolution or better sensitivity? Better sensitivity. It, they're converting the sensitivity into resolutions. It's a tricky thing. So it's actually a sensitivity measurement. And what they're doing is, this thing is the unknown phase phi, right? So when the pi phase shift is there, you see this darkness, okay? And then the amoeba swims, this is the amoeba, it gives you phi. And then phi is reconstructed in this 4A transform plane as the image, right? Okay, in some sense. So you want to measure the phi as well as possible. So it's actually a sensitivity measurement. So I, I was confused too at the beginning. So I'm ending with sensitivity and then heading towards resolution. And the question, the good question, what's the difference? But the spatial resolution isn't improved. No. It's also it, lambda over 2. Yeah, lambda over 2 is not improved, but you can see the, the inside of the bacteria is slightly better. So this is, this clearly, so I have to, I, I've been shamed that I didn't point out some experiments from Israel. Okay, so I unshamed myself, yeah, on Silberberg's group uh, in Weizmann, okay, and then using known states, this is instead of measuring the, um, the phase shift, like in the microscope, remember the experiment of Kuzmich and Mandel where I showed the data, this was a polarization measurement, actually. So you can translate the phase you're trying to measure to a polarization angle, and there are many applications where you would like to measure polarization of, of light better than the uh, shot noise limit. So if you stare at this long enough, you can see there's the singles, these are the doubles, and these are the triples, I think, yeah. And uh, they actually have enough, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Good, the visibility is good enough to get super resolution means more wiggles, okay? Super sensitivity means when you plug it into this formula, you get better than one over the square root of n. So that's the difference. All right. So remember we converted this thing to this to make it the simpler to draw. And, and so I dump all of the source over here and all of the detection and the beam splitter here into a box, and then we analyze it this way. Now, this one step caused endless confusion in the community in the year 2001, as, because when we introduced the noon state, the noon state is the state inside the box, past, it's what the source produces. So if I go back here, the noon state is past the first beam splitter, here, okay? So I need a magic beam splitter or some other thing to actually make the noon state. So when we started publishing results, there was, there was uh, Pierre Meister at University of Arizona and some guy at the Army, and we said in our paper, you must make the noon state on the other side of the beam splitter. So they didn't read our paper, but they were happy to write nasty comments about our paper. Dowling is crazy. If you put a noon state into the first beam splitter, you get crap, okay? And uh, I had to email Pierre Meister and say, if you actually read the paper, you would find that you don't get crap. Uh, and he retracted his, uh, the other guy uh, got it on the archive, but then I talked to the editor and that was the end of him. Okay, so don't mess with Dowling. Okay, so there's our noon state, all n up, zero down plus all n down, zero up. Okay, so this is the, the lesson here, okay. We want the noon state inside of the interferometer. Now, last time I gave you some complicated way of making noon states using controlled not gates and, or nonlinear optics, all very complicated stuff. So the question is, well, what if I don't have a magic beam splitter? I just have a regular one, right, Professor Eisenberg, regular beam splitter, he's falling asleep. You should have no, had a second. No, in hybrid, yeah. Uh, you're, you're, you're hibernating, okay, fine. No, in hybrid. You're hibriding, okay. With what, we don't know, okay. So the qu natural question to ask is, if I have a new, I require a noon state here, 
It's very simple to use my, remember I gave you the beam splitter transformations, either the classical or the A and A dagger. I need the A and A dagger ones, okay? With the quantum operators. I can take the noon state, transform it backwards and say, what is it? If I can make that in the lab, then I get a noon state on inside and I'm fine, okay? So if you do this calculation, I will leave this as an exercise to the students, okay? You get a horrible mess with binomial coefficients and blah, 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 blah. And you show it to Nadav Katz, he goes, I can't make that in a million years, okay? So that was the end of that, we thought. Okay, but then this paper came out 2007, okay? So this is, people, so once we wrote these papers saying noon states were good for resolution and sensitivity, everybody began saying, how, would, how are we gonna make the noon states? So this was a nice paper, and again, all these papers are in the folder in the, uh, on the online when you go to the class folder, it has this name, okay? So the idea was, you can, instead of having the perfect new thing that makes a noon state, what if I have something that's close? And this was a revolution to me, okay? So what they do, this, remember our single mode squeezed vacuum that we inject into LIGO, the squeeze state with the little squashed watermelon looking thing, okay? So that goes there, and this goes here. This is exactly the setup for LIGO, where I take a coherent state, and that was vacuum plug the unused port, right? Vacuum sucks, so we get rid of it. But now, instead of this being 10 to the 20 photons, and this being 10, I'm gonna make them both around 10. And so we're gonna go away from LIGO to something more reasonable. So uh, instead of getting a factor of two, I can actually do a bit better. So what they showed was if you take this laser, squeeze vacuum from one of a guy's magic crystals, okay, and you put them into, this is 50-50 beam splitter, you get a state, okay? And it's also a, a terrible looking thing with binomial coefficients and all of this other <coughs> stuff. But if you do a calculation, inside the interferometer, the overlap of the known state with squeezed vacuum and coherent state past the first interferometer inside, the overlap in the limit that n, this is n bar in our, uh, no, this is n in our notation, okay, is eight ninths, my lucky number, square root of eight ninths, at 94.3%. So the astonishing trick was Instead of putting in an exact state that gives me the noon state, I put in an approximate state that gives me a noon state. What was the degree of squeezing? Squeezing. The, the squeezing uh, I'm getting, can, I, it'll be on the plots. We have so we don't give it in terms of squeezing. We give it in terms of n bar, which is sin squared of the squeezing parameter. You will have to do the inverse hyperbolic transformation on your own. Okay. So, but the point is, it turns out when the n and the noon state uh, that you want, well, okay, when the, what am I doing? Go back. When the n of the coherent state is approximately equal to the n in the squeezer, then you get the best result. That was the, the magic point. So remember, for LIGO, this is 10 to the 20th, and this is 10, they're, they're not locked together in terms of the same uh, intensity, so you don't, you only get a factor of two in LIGO. But if I bring LIGO down by 20 orders of magnitude, then I get something pretty good. Right, everybody's falling asleep. Whack the guy in the uniform. He's supposed to be paying attention. He's being paid to get back. Um, got the stick. All right. So the point is, is the overlap is nearly uh, is 95 percent, which is good enough. Okay. So that's the bizarre thing. If you take a squeeze vacuum in a coherent state, you don't have to go. I, I wasn't. I wasn't being mean. Right, he's going to wash his face. Okay. Get some coffee. All right. So the magic thing is that a squeeze state, so you, I always ask myself, why is it that when you take a squeeze state and a coherent laser beam and you mix them on a beam splitter, like Cave says in 1981, you do so well? Well, it's because it's approximately a noon state, which we prove is the optimal state inside of the interferometer. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this. Now remember we talked about the MNF, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Yerke state, and we had the twin Fox state, and I think those are the only ones I discussed. Well, oh, and then we talked about the coherent statement mixed with squeeze vacuum. All of those guys, when you put them past the beam splitter, the overlap with the noon state is like 90 something percent. So noon states are a unifying thing that all, before it was, I guess a state, twin fox, Yerke, 
squeeze vacuum, whatever, I try it and see what happens. Now we know you don't guess the state, you find the state that has, after the beam splitter, an overlap with the noon state, because noon state is optimal, that's large, and you do well. And so here is the, the plot from the theory paper. And so we're going to actually show data from the Israeli group at around n bar is equal to 5. Sometimes they write, this is actually n, because they're making a projective measurement onto the n equal 5 component of the noon state. But you see there's a, a 90, 91, somewhere at 91.25% uh, fidelity overlap. And then it's kind of weird. It goes down, and then it goes back up, and it settles down on, what was it, the square root of 8 over 9, or whatever that was. Okay, so this is the experiment from Jaron Silberberg as group. Uh, Jaron was, the, I think, the father of quantum optics in Israel. Right? He was doing nonlinear optics, and then people in this room, like Hagai Eisenberg, did the PhD there, and then... So you have Lior Cohen is, where did he go? The phone outside. Yeah, he's on the phone outside. He is the god, uh, the, the, the grandson of Silverberg. And uh, so this is the paper from here. So they basically take the idea of the Holger Hoffman. A and B, there's your quantum vacuum, okay, the squeeze vacuum classical state, and the optimal you can show, God, it's n bar squeezed equals n bar coherent is optimal. You know, I, I, I can go through, but maybe that's obvious. Okay, and what they do then is that, so, so if you look at the, this is the probability that I get m photons in one arm and n photons in the other arm. Okay, so, ah, there you are. I was talking about you, I said, well, Kefir, yeah, Kefir yeah. was asking what good is this at low photon numbers, and I said, I gave several, now you have to go back and look at the slides for your homework, but you can measure uh, things that you don't want to kill with bright photon numbers, like bacteria, virus, or protein. If you put a bright source on it, it kills it or denatures it. So you can use this to actually measure things that you don't, in situ, that you don't want to destroy with a higher power beam. That's the point. That was the point for you. I prepared two slides just for you, and you're late. Okay. so. This is the, we're going to look at the n equal 5, okay, so 5, if I did this right, uh, is this one, okay. So the point is, what does this mean? It's either I get 5 here and 0 here, or 5 here and 0 here. So that if I superimpose them, it's 5, 0, 0, 5. That's how you interpret the graph, okay. So what if instead of putting in a coherent state, I put in ordinary vacuum, which is, remember, you never do, I'll plug the unused port. Or you get moon-like components, but you get this crap in the middle, okay, which dominates. This is the poop, okay. What is poop in the group? Cock. Cock. It's the cock. Okay. But poo poo pee all right, okay, the poop. This, you don't want this, and it's bigger than the noon component, so it tends to wash stuff out. You can still do the projective measurement into the noon component and get super resolution. Andrew White did this. Oh, guy, you said the record was... It's, the, it's five for it. It's six. Andrew White did six. But with just coherent states by projecting into the noon basis. But the efficiency is very, very low. Okay. But anyway, you want to get rid of the poop. And so by doing this, this guy is very small compared to these guys, and that's the magic. Wait, I'm sorry, what's P? What's the vertical axis? Uh, this probability. is the probability. probability. So think of the arms, okay? So noon state is I have N here, zero N. here, or the reverse, okay? So here's the probability is five I have in one arm and zero in the other, or five I have in this arm or zero in the other. It's the joint number probability. So, uh, uh, but it's hard to show a superposition in such a plot, you have to imagine the superposition. So this stuff dominates, so you don't want to do this. Okay, so the, uh, this is, you can do n equal 5 or n equal 12. Why is that n equal 1? There should be n equal 5. It says n equal 5 right there. Okay. Oh, I see. The red line is the oscillations you would get for the singles, right? The classical. So this is the classical resolution. You get one wave, half wavelength uh, between uh, 0 and 2 pi. And then, but here, because this is 5, I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 
five, because it wraps around. Okay, so those are five fold oscillations. And I could do n equals 12. So super, you, in some sense, you need super resolution to get super sensitivity. But if your fidelity is not high enough, if your loss is, you can get super resolution without super sensitivity. So one does not imply the other. In this experiment, and they actually did not get super sensitivity. I went back and looked. They have super resolution at five, but not super sensitivity. So the record is actually still four with Jeremy O'Brien. I'm just giving you the history. Depending what you count. What, what, what you count. Right, 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 right. So sensitivity, the record is four. The record is five or six, depending on whether you believe Andrew White or you're on Silverberg. Okay, but there's the experiment. This is what it looks like in real life. Notice once again they move to the HV polarization. It's easier to align the photons if the moon state is in H and V because they co-propagate. Or if they propagate on different paths, then you have to make sure this path is very well aligned to this path, which is harder to do. So they often work in this polarization basis. Okay, and then we see the data. Okay, so there's your singles. Okay. And then this is the two, two fold. And he doesn't even draw the singles. So the singles would be this one peak, but we see two peaks. Okay, these are your ones. Your ones. Your ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this is the three, one, two, three. Okay, very. Easy, intuitive. No, it's no, it's one. Three. Oh, this is three. One, two, three. And this is four and five. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it goes. Yes. I don't. I, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. A, four or five. B, a B B is just the, they they put a pi phase shifter. C also the pi. Oh, it's phase. another term. It's the two zero and this is the one one. Is this the one one? No, the the two photons, the two graphs. One of them is the odd and one of them is the even. Yeah, term. yeah. Okay, okay. I, I I'm just looking at the top one. Two peaks. Two. One, two, three, four, four. Three, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. And there's more than two pi. Because there's more than two pi. There's more than two pi. Yeah, it wraps around, it wraps around. Okay. This is this is the same peak as this, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. So you can see there's two things going on. The fringe you're getting more and more fringes. That's super resolution. I'm glad you guys are enjoying yourselves today. <laughs> Do I get rated by the students? Yeah. How well I did? It's based. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, it's it based on the quality of my stand-up comedy routine. Okay. <laughs> you, you need at least at least six uh, students to respond. To. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, so the point is, you could see a couple of things that are going on here. Notice, this is 400. This is, uh, now that's the two, and this is, this is the 0.3, <coughs> and then this guy is 0.03. The tenfold. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the visibility is getting crappier and crappier and crappier. No, this is because they're using um, um, uh, concatenated uh, detectors. So yeah, the I, beam don't, and, uh, I don't care what it's due to. So the beam splitter reduces the efficiency. I'm not going to let you get up, it'll never end. Okay. Yeah, so the efficiency gets worse. So that's why you can see super sensitivity at two because the visibility is very good. But if it starts getting poor and poor and poor, you reach a threshold where you no longer see the super sensitivity, the one over square root of n. But you still see the super resolution, which is the multiple peaks. Okay, so that's, this is supposed to introduce that concept. So recap, okay, the red line is your singles, okay, over two pi. The green line, this is for, well, one, two, Three. This is n equals three. Okay, and so you can see I have the super resolution, three peaks versus one. If the visibility is perfect, I also have the super sensitivity. I calculate delta m. I cal and then I convert this to delta phi via the formula I gave. And if everything's perfect, I get one over square root of three improvement. Okay, but if the visibility starts, so how can we explain this? Remember when I said the sharper the peak the easier it is to tell if it moves, right? That's the whole thing of super sensitivity. But what if this peak is crappier by two orders of magnitude than the red peak, okay? If the loss and so forth brings this peak down, then the slope starts getting worse and worse and worse, and at some point, it's even worse than the red one, and you don't do any improvement. So you have to have really, really, really good uh, detection with high visibility in order to see the super sensitivity. But super resolution is easier, okay, which is the topic of this. So, 
Super resolution, the wavelength goes to lambda, lambda over n. Super sensitivity is this extra thing. And I, as I learned at Elat yesterday. Elta. Elta. Elta? What's Elat? Elat is a town. It's a town itself. Oh, 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 okay. As I learned at Elta, which is Elat with the letters rearranged, from this guy here who is taking notes or sending messages to his friends. Ah, he's thinking about very good. Okay, on the phone. That the uh, supersensitivity is what matters. That you can get easily uh, if you have lots and lots and lots and lots of photons in your radar scheme. But when you only get few photons, this is the one that's important. Okay, so this is for you too. Right? That's why I wanted you awake. I actually redid this just after our discussions from yesterday at Elta and not Elat. It's the same letters? Exactly the same letters? No, no, no but not even close. Okay. Okay, so delta, elat, I think it's the same. it's just an anagram of the, 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 the I. In the uh, okay. All right, so I had been looking at this super sensitivity stuff. Remember, there was the Yerkes state, and then I tried to make the Yerkes states, and I had the quantum gyro, blah 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 blah, and we saw the wiggles and everything, and then uh, this is uh, you can see I'm at NASA. Where am I? Jet Propulsion Lab, Caltech, NASA. <clears throat> so we have a meeting. I joined NASA in fall of 1998. So I've only been there two years. Colin Williams is uh, actually still kind of the, the chief scientist, but I kicked him out and took over shortly after this. But the, so one day, Colin says, I have this Italian industrialist who's interested in marketing quantum technologies. Okay? And we're going to meet with him. So I show up as usual to the meeting late, okay, and there's a table, there's a ta crazy <coughs> Italian guy, and Colin is from England, so he has the tie, the suit, and looks very, he's the boss. Okay. So I, we sit down, and, and we're writing, I'm writing some things on the board, and talking about different technologies. And I start talking about gyroscopes, blah, 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 gyroscopes, and that's what I talked about last time. And then the Italian guy, we don't know if he had deep insight or it's like a parrot just ra randomly saying where it goes, what about lithography? Gay lithography. And so Colin, the guy with the tie, says, what are you talking about? This is, we're talking about gyroscopes. There's nothing to do with lithography, okay? It's, okay. it's Tourette. It's called the Tourette syndrome. Yeah, the, the Tourette syndrome. Ah, what about lithography? Ah, okay. Uh, but I, I never thought about it in that context. I just needed that one hint. So suddenly, I hear lithography, and I go back like this into my chair, okay. So the Italian guy is going, lithography, lithography, and Dowling is barely gone into a coma, and I'm sitting, and he's like, right, Dowling, wake up, wake up, wake up. No, 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 I'm thinking. So I finally open my eyes, and I go, can I borrow a sheet of your paper? And he goes, you didn't bring paper and a pen? Can I, can I borrow the pen? Okay. To this meeting? And I go, no, no, no. He goes, I'm going to charge you a dollar for the paper and the pen. And I said, that's okay. When I give it back to you, it'll be worth billions. Okay? That was the, one of the most exciting moments of my life because I realized these wiggles, could, there's a way to transfer it into an, a lithographic resist and actually do lithography below the Rayleigh diffraction limit. And in lithography, they don't care about supersensitivity. They only talk Rayleigh diffraction limit. And this is your most cited paper. It is. I, in fact, I knew you would ask. Oh. <laughs> so, this is a review article. I was afraid you missed that. Review article. Uh, no, no. I, I, I have narcissistic personality disorder, as uh, Gilly will tell you. <laughs> so, uh, but this is, review articles will get lots of. But this is my, uh, uh, you know, small paper. So the next one is in the hundreds. So this is like an order of magnitude. More sided than anything. Little cock is in both papers of them. Yeah. yeah. But again, kefir. For, for lithography, you need is it kefir? Fear. 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 You need a huge number of slide. photons to do lithography, and there is no way to, to get this number of photons in any of these uh, special quantum states. That's why I don't have the Nobel Prize. And neither the billions. <laughs> right. If, if this had worked, yeah, uh, probably Intel. I would be. I would not be here. Intel would have bought me out. I would be having a nice house in Malibu next to Tom Cruise. Okay, so, but the idea was the critical, important thing. Okay, Peter Knight, <laughs> Sir Peter Knight said, this was the first time he realized there was some use for entanglement besides quantum computers. 
So this was a, a, mo a gestalt moment in the community where they said, entanglement, you can do sub something else. Okay. So here's the scheme. Uh, we first said, we know how to make, remember the Hongo Mandel dance, the both photons go this way, both photons go that way, or, or they do this, or they do this, but this one cancels with this, and then you only get that plus that. All right, that's Hongo Mandel. So you send in one, one, which we can do using the, uh, the squeezed photon source in a guy's lab, okay? And you get the low new and stick, exactly the same as in the Mandel. Okay. And the idea then is, is that the phase shift is actually the, like LIGO, it's the difference in path length between these two arms. You scan down this material, which is a two photon absorbing material, and you get this. Okay, you, you can tell this is so old, it's, uh, it, it's been scanned in, there's no, okay. So this is, this is something we call the quantum deposition rate, which is just the, uh, the two photon absorption rate uh, for the nonlinear optic. It's in Bob Boyd's book. Did you bring the book? Not today. No, okay, okay. It's in Bob Boyd's book, two photon absorption. Quantum version of two photon absorption was first worked out by who? Who? Maria Gerpet Meyer, um, one of the three women Nobel Prize winners in physics. Maria Gerpet Meyer, Marie Curie, and Donna Strickland. Okay. So when she wasn't busy figuring out the uh, 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 um, relativistic corrections in nuclei, she was the first one to write down the full quantum theory of two photon absorption. And so this is the, the this solid line is just one photon absorption. Okay. Then the uh, dashed line is two photon absorption without entanglement. I can shine a bright laser beam onto a system, I look at the two photon absorption, lithographers look at this because it gives you a, a slightly, I got it backwards, the, the uh, you get a, the dashed one is the, re, is the, just the, the standard, yeah, the, the dashed one is the standard, okay, this is classical two photon, you get a narrower feature, and I like that, but the magic of quantum lithography is that it's the narrowest feature, but you get peaks in the middle, right, okay, there's guys there and guys there. That's your super resolution. So if you're at Intel, it means I can write, I can take a red laser, lambda, entangle them two at a time. I get lambda over two. What's lambda over two? Blue? Ish? Very blue. 390? 390. Okay, what is that? Blue. Blue. I guessed right. Blue, okay. So I now pretend I have a machine that can write wavelength as if it was blue, but I don't have a blue laser, I have a red one, but it, with a magic entangled device on this, okay? And I get two times as many transistors that way, and two times as many transistors that way, two times two is four, I get eight times as many transistors on the chip. And I don't have to switch from a red laser system to a blue laser system, which costs like a billion dollars. I just put the magic entangling device on the end of the red laser and out comes it. And then if I do 10, 10 times as many, n equal 10, or n equal five, then I get 25 as many transistors on the chip, okay? And I'm writing, okay, so red divided by five is UV or X-ray? UV. UV, okay. They spent a lot of time going from blue to UV back in the 70s or 80s, right? The, the magic quantum wand. The problem is, is that making this resist, <coughs> the two photon absorption process is less probable than one photon, and three photon absorption is less probable than two, so the probability that it actually works starts to scale badly, exponentially get badly as you go up. Uh, there was a, a sort of a mock-up experiment done by uh, Jan Washi's group at the University of Maryland, they do the 2002, and you can see here the singles, and you can see the more wiggles per, per, per fringe. Instead of a two photon absorbing resist, they do a two photon detection scheme and, and scan it, as pretending it's a two photon absorbing resist. And we had a long discussion with some people at the University of Texas, is that they gave us some samples of a two photon absorbing material, and we tried this in our lab at, at NASA. And, but it didn't work. And then we said, we went back and said, it doesn't work really well at low photon numbers. Oh yeah, we put something in the material to cut off the low photon numbers because that gives us a narrower feature. And they go, but we want a new material 
that gives us, uh, cuts off the high photon numbers and only gives us, and they said, don't call us, we'll call you. Okay, so they never, so, so it's never really, I don't think it's ever been demonstrated with a real resist, but maybe that was not the right application. Joe? Yeah. Maybe it's worth uh, mentioning uh, the, the main criticism on the two photon, not on one, is that all of these experiments were created by down conversion. So you actually okay. start, start with the right wavelength. Right. You, you start you with the purple, when you down convert the red, and then write as if it was purple again. Right? Yeah. Well, that's why in our PRL, we say you must go to high noon. The challenge was you have to go past two for, in order for this to be useful. I think it was done in, uh, in vapor cells. In vapor cells, yeah, yeah, yeah. That were there. Uh, also your own students. Well, well, yeah, right. But not in an actual lithic. You know, vapor cell is not a photographic resist. So that's why I'm here lecturing this fine group of people in Israel and not sitting in my beach house in Malibu drinking margaritas. Okay. You never invite, uh, invited me there. Well, I don't have a beach house in Malibu. This is a, this is a multiple <laughs> universe. There's a parallel universe where Dowling has a beach house and he doesn't know you. <laughs> Lucky him. <laughs> Lucky him, right, right, right. But I, I have an a, a idea for a new religion where in the multi-universe theory of religion. So my life is crappy, I have to write proposals, my, my ex-wife took all the money. But there's a parallel universe where Dowling has a, a beach house in Malibu and margaritas and when I die, I go there. Okay. <laughs> I probably could sell it. Okay, so... You're this, not dying, you're just uh, collapsing. In the yeah, universe. collapse into the other universe. <laughs> this, is, this is Steinberg's group from Toronto. And uh, they actually were able to do this again using a pixelated detector. So there was a, so like with the uh, the vapor instead of atoms, they had a pixelated detector, and they got the super resolution. But it's still not a photographic resist. All right. So I promised to talk about this, and this is kind of cool. Okay. So this is OCT, optical coherence tomography is a scheme where you can look at things. They often use this to look for diseases in the, in the eyeball. That you have your eyeball, actually many, many, many layers of different proteins in the eyeball, okay? And in certain diseases, the proteins are malformed or there's some tumor or something. Detachment. Yeah, 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 detachment. So you put your eyeball here, okay? Good idea. And then you send a femtowatt laser beam into your eyeball and, and then hope for the best. So, so the idea is, is that in the OCT, they send a pulse thing, femtosecond wide pulse, and think of the femtosecond as like a knife edge. Your knife is this sharp, as, so picosecond is sharper than, uh, oh, which one's smaller femto? Femto. femto? femto is, yeah, femto is smaller than pico, so the smaller it is, the better your knife, okay? So the pulse is moving through this thing, and then it goes here, you have a tunable mirror, adjustable length, okay? And here it goes into the eyeball, and then you, here you have the second beam splitter and you try to make constructive interference. And the constructive interference occurs when this path length and this path length are the same. Remember the interferometer where it all goes out one port? Okay, so the point is you can adjust this and then make images, or at least, not images is not a good word, interference diagram that shows you something about different layers in the eye. So as I adjust this, I can go down through the different layers looking for a disease or a tumor or a cataract, whatever. The problem is, there's two problems. Well, one is the way it's limited to the lambda over to the wavelength of your light. That's your resolution. There's no sensitivity here. So you can resolve only at the wavelength <coughs> of the light. So if you use red light, you're stuck with, you know, uh, 500 nanometers or whatever. Okay, but there's another problem. And I'm not going to go into this too much because it's a little off the scale, but there's a reference there you can look up. And the other problem is I'm sending in a knife edge, femtosecond, fem femtosecond pulse, okay? Femtosecond pulse moves into this eyeball stuff. The eyeball has a second order dispersion, so the pulse begins to spread as it propagates through the eyeball. So your knife becomes dull and dull and no cook would use it. So the deeper you go, the worse the dispersion and then you get a very blurry image. So even though you're sharp, you're sharp, your knife is sharp to start, by the time it comes out of the eyeball, it's dull, and you get a bad image. So quantum gives you two things. It gives you lambda goes to lambda over two. You get an improvement in resolution by a factor of two. And this is a whole nother, this is when I come next year to give another course. Uh, 
the two photons that come out of the, this is your nonlinear crystal, the, the sque this is two mode squeezed vacuum in the terms of the, of, of the experts. So when these photons come out, the photons come out, and so suppose they both come out as uh, red, we'll say red, okay? But there's a spread. This has a little blue shift and this has a little uh, blue shift as well. Over the photons, I drew a plot very early on. This is the frequency of the photons must add up to the frequency of the pump. So if this is shifted a little to the red, this one is shifted a little bit to the blue. So I measure this photon, if he is reddish, this one is bluish. But if, but if I measure this one and he is reddish, this one is bluish. It collapses the wave function so that you always get the sum of the two guys is equal to the frequency of the pump. So you don't know, is this one reddish and this one's bluish or the reverse? It's a superposition, you must add them. And if you do this exactly right, that superposition of the two frequencies cancels out the second order dispersion. So now I'm doing an experiment very much like the Hong Ol Mandel. I send this guy through, I get, this is the one ones are coming through. I don't have the beam splitter in here. Uh, but the point is, is that as they propagate down here and then they recombine, the, the correlation time of the two photons in Heinle Mandel is femtoseconds, which is what you want your knife edge to be, okay? So the arrival time of the two photons, you only see a Heinle Mandel dip, which is the, 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 the uh, uh, which is, here is where the one ones go here, here's the two zero zero two. You look at this dip, and the dip has femtosecond width, and then as you scan this guy, that femtosecond peak moves around, but because of the entanglement dispersion cancellation, it never gets wider like it does with the classical one. So you knock out second order dispersion and your knife stays sharp. Pretty cool, I think. The, I'm not going to explain this in detail, but you also get a lambda over two. Can I remark on OCT? On OCT. You want to go to the board? No, no, no just uh, one thing. Because people laughed before. Well, if you're going to remark, you have to talk to the whole Yeah, audience. they can hear me. Can you, can you hear them? Yes, they can. No. <laughs> no? Nadav cannot hear me, but they, anyway. I hear you too well. O OCT, it, it, when, when it was invented at the end of the 90s, I think it's a Japanese guy, I think his name is Yamamoto in, a, in, a, in Boston. So it, it's one of the inventions that went into the medical examination room like the fastest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like less than two years after that, there was, there was equipment in the uh, optologist. And today, you, can, you cannot go into an optologist without he having this uh, instrument okay. in his life. So, it's so, very, very common. It's not a unique, right. obscure well, that, device. That, so this is good. That the point is, is that quantum is good for something you find when you go to see your eye doctor, potentially. Okay. So here is the classical OCT is this guy. And you can see, it's very hard to see. So what we're, this is the delay line. So I'm looking at stuff in the eyeball. Okay? There's all this classical stuff. This is the quantum here. And you can see these peaks are much narrower than this guy. And so that's the idea. You could resolve much better using the quantum technique. And you get also a factor of two improvement in the signal. Is it a good time for a break? Yeah, good, perfect, because I'm switching now to something of interest to the guy in the uniform. So, who is fairly awake now. So 10 past 5? 10 yeah. past 5 or 5 past 5? 10 past 5? Yeah, 10 past, it's a two hour talk, right? Yes. Kiefer! Do you want coffee from downstairs? Do you want coffee from downstairs? No, I don't know. Not, that's why I'm not doing it, because it's a rather easy calculation. So you send in your pump, let's say it's UV, and out come two red, right? But the mean frequency is, is red, okay? So this has some omega. So what has to happen is the frequency of the two daughter photons, we'll call this signal, this is idler, which is the standard notation. So the signal plus the idler must equal the frequency of the pump. If I put H bars, this is conservation of energy. Right, that's it. Okay. But that just really says the mean value. Now the frequency of the pump is very, very precise because you have a very stable like laser and so forth. So this is very precise. But these guys have spread.
They have a, a, quite a bit of a spread to them, okay? But here's the magic trick. When this one is plus, this one is minus. Because the sum must always add up. Yeah, so if this is slightly shifted in one direction, this one must be shifted in the other direction in order to match the bump. So now if you go through and look at the second order dispersion, the second order dispersion is, is what does that come from, right? You have, here's my femtosecond pulse, right? This is a classical. I, I send it through the dispersion material. This can be thought of as having many, many, many different wavelengths, right? Each wavelength moves at a different speed and it spreads, okay? But now imagine, you don't know if this guy in the front, so let's make it frequency. So this is, so all these frequencies spread. That's classical dispersion, okay? Second order dispersion. So my knife gets brought. Okay. But now, this is my central frequency omega over two because of this guy. But one of these guys is a bit ahead. So you don't know in principle if this one is here, delta omega uh, s, or if it's here, okay? So you, you know that if this one is shifted plus, this one is shifted minus, but it could be, it's a superposition of this and this. That's the trick. Right? So the, they both go through the eye. They both go through the eye, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so the point is, is that the superposition of these guys, you don't, it, they must be, one must be plus and one must be minus, but you cannot tell in principle which one is which you add them coherently and then it cancels out the second order dispersion. It's a very cute trick. But that's not resolution, so I, I'll leave that for when I come back next year to give a series of lectures on dispersion. If I live to this one. No, so you don't send both beams through the eye. No, 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 you don't send both frequencies to the eye. But you do have both frequencies. You have a positive frequency and a negative frequency right, right, right. simultaneously because you're creating a wave packet which is broad. Right, right. So you do not send both beams through the eye. Here. The point is, is that, so, so notice this shows blue and this shows red. But really, it's a, so this means it's slightly red shifted, this one's like, but, but it's a superposition. It could be this one is the red, and this is the blue. And the actual interference occurs here that, that gives you the cancellation of the dispersion. It's a tricky calculation to do. This, okay, one photon. Okay, so one photon is plus, the other one is minus. But you don't know if this is plus and this is minus, or this is plus and this is minus. So I have the superposition, I have to draw two Feynman diagrams. You know what is a Feynman diagram? Yeah. There's two Feynman diagrams. One is red up, red to red shift is up, blue shift is down, plus red shift is down, blue shift is up. So it's just like my Hongo manual, you have to add them. And when you add them, then the, it turns out that the dispersion term cancels, second order dispersion can, cancels. It's very much like Hongo manual. So there's two things going on. Right? You can't tell if the red's up or the blue's down or the other way around. I'll give you the paper. This is one of them. The paper? This is the paper that describes this experiment, but the reference to the theory is in here. Yeah, so the theory is due to Chow, Steinberg, and Quiat 1995. But it's in this paper in the reference. Okay, they, they reference it. So you have to kind of go through, but the best way to think of it is this Feynman pass, okay? One for red blue, one for blue red. You don't know which, you add them and you get destructive cancellation in the second order dispersion. This is a really cool result, right? Because a lot of things that you want to do where dispersion kills you, say, like in telecommunication, you send these pulses down the fiber and they spread, you know, so there are many things where you might want to get rid of second order dispersion. And this is a magic trick. Okay, now I will use the toilet. I <laughs> know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
So I have a question. Everywhere I go, in the restaurant, they have a in the sink, cup with two handles. This is for religious blessing or washing? When you wash your hands with this thing. Something like that. Up to the arms. Yeah, Men and women or just everybody? Yeah. Okay. So it's like a... Because you have to bless it on the breast. Uh -huh. yeah. But why is it in here? Because there's no bread. I normally see it in restaurants. Because some things didn't... The students bring it. Ah, so any meal at all, portable or non-portable. Yeah. Okay, now you can ask your question. <laughs> Are you registered? Oh, I see. So you can't so go here. Yeah, the site is hidden. You have to copy the URL and paste. <laughs> good, good math. Okay. It's, there's three, seven, eight, zero, zero. And then if you click on it, it I, I'm too lazy to do that. I'm too lazy to do that. That takes a lot of time. You get this? Okay. So these are the primary videos today. Is lecture. And then you can get PDF, PDF, and then the papers I cite Yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. I had an intuition. I can make a control not using a nonlinear. Or I can do it making these projective measurements. So I said, there must be a connection. So I sat down and I was in Vienna and I was visiting Anton Zeiler. So he shows me the lab and there's something he can do with it. So then I go to my office, there's John Seidt, who's another theorist from Toronto. And I goes, he goes, another theorist! Like that. So we broke into a classroom. Yeah, I said, look, there's got to be a connection. And we sketched it out, and my two whole spots wrote it out. So, and then I began talking about this, and I said, this is a revolution in nonlinear optics. And, and, and I remember giving this talk for the first time in 2003, and Bill Phillips, who has a Nobel Prize, says, I don't believe it. Okay, this is completely not and then 10 years later, I gave the same talk, and he says, oh, it's completely obvious. Right, 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 right. But the fact that you can do this with the expensive nonlinear material with linear optics and detectors is going to the same results as astonishing to Bill Phillips 20 years ago, but not astonishing in 10 years ago. So that was, this was, I mean, unfortunately, the paper is highly mathematical. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but I think it was a very good 
ויש רכיבים שהם נמצאים פה את הפספזה, ואתה פשוט יכול לגודל פה את זה. זה בעצם אותו דבר. יש, 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 יש. This is so nobody at home bothers me. Can you come to the meeting for the faculty meeting? I have a choice to ignore it. So if somebody says, would you refer read this paper? If I don't respond, then they say, well, he's not reading it either. But for important people like you, I respond. You're enjoying the stand-up comedy routine? But this is this this cancellation of the dispersion. This is not you know, I mean Franson did a version with Dean Workman and then we had Steinberg and, and Chow did it did a, a better version than the first experiment. It's not trivial because all, everything has to stay symmetric. Yeah, anti-symmetric. If your dispersion is too large or your bandwidth is too big, it's tough. Yeah, you have to, yeah. So you have to. In the first Franson scheme, they couldn't get the Franson scheme to work quite right. So they pulled out and Steinberg went back and they put in the bandwidths and everything. And then they sort of rigged the experiment to match the bandwidth. As a proof of principle. This was what Katz was saying, is that it's a very, it's kind of a restrictive thing. Okay, so we do it with this microscope. The bandwidth of the, the delta omega signal and delta omega idler has to kind of match what, what the actual dispersion is in the material. So it's not a very generic thing. You, the, you, know, the, the, you, you can make it work, but it's... it's it's not generalizable to lots and lots of systems. But you, you can do this version gets worse the shorter the, the pulse width, but you're not sending femtosecond pulses. Your, your pulses are centimeters or meters or something. Yeah, so, so I think the dispersion of the atmosphere for those wavelengths is not so bad, so it wouldn't help for radar. Could I use this to cancel dispersion for radar, Dan? Yeah. Well, right. It's, I, my point is, it's not bad because their pulses are many, many centimeters wide. Yeah, but the, but the atmosphere probably doesn't start giving a bad dispersion until you get down to. Those that can, I mean, I don't know. The dispersion is a spectral thing. It's how far. So what he's what he's thinking? You accumulate a mass phase. So what you do with the phase? It's going to screw up the quadrature. It's going to go far enough. And these things travel hundreds of hundreds of kilometers. Right. So so nobody. Maybe it's a good idea. Maybe it's a thing. I don't know the numbers. Right, 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 right. But, but that's the point we're trying to learn. Where the hell is it? There. So the idea is that this is some part of the atmosphere. Yeah. Right, and so the dispersion would add up. Right? So I'm sending both radar. And then here you're the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So could I do something like this? But I'd have to keep this at the lay line. Okay. Just measure it. Just measure that side digitally. Oh, right, right, right. Because you, you don't have to be have a clock or something. You measure the noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I keep thinking too much like an optical person. With radio waves, you just record it on a hard drive and then correlate it later. Ah, that's a good idea. We should think that's about That's what that. I mentioned yesterday. You, you can really measure it. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And but then you can digitally... Well, you know, when they do synthetic radio wave apertures, they just record it on a thumb drive, and they bring it to some central station, and but if you try to do this in optics, you have to phase it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. נמשיך? <laughs> 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 I love the Sir Haggai, the quiet. Oh, Haggai. Oh, Haggai. Oh, Eisenberg. Oh, Eisenberg. Sounds like a song. Oh, you know Eisenberg. Oh, Eisenberg. You know oh, Eisenberg. You know what's old? I'm so uncertain how I feel about you. <laughs> it's on video. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Lucky you. So we published this paper on super resolution. And, uh, and you never know what's going to happen when you publish a paper on something. So a guy, not a guy, but a guy, a guy. named Ned Allen, at, he was at Lockheed Martin at the time. Still is. Still he, is. He still is. Okay. CTO. He's now the CTO at Lockheed Martin. So he read my paper on quantum lithography. Astonishing that anybody read it. I guess he cited it. It's, and he said, oh, we could beat the diffraction limit. And the diffraction limit is something you worry about when this is supposed to be a scud, right? So something it, we worry about a lot in Israel, okay? A flying object. A flying object. And for cert certain, certain regimes where you don't have a lot of photons coming back, uh, the Rayleigh diffraction, if you have lots and lots and lots of photons, I learned from the Japanese car maker Nissan, that then you don't you can get much much better than Rayleigh, but if you get very few photons, then Rayleigh becomes your limit, and a beating Rayleigh is a big deal. But I know nothing about this because I know nothing about radar. Uh, but uh, uh, suddenly this call for proposals comes out from the American Mafat, which is DARPA, okay, for like millions of dollars, and in it it, it cites my paper. It cites noon states and says, we want to send entangled states through the atmosphere to incoming missiles. And I go, that's the craziest thing I ever heard of in my life, okay? okay? And, uh, and we'll give you $2 million. They go, oh, it's less crazy now, okay? <laughs> so we, we wrote a proposal and we put in noon states and all of this other stuff, knowing nothing about radar system. They were actually focusing at this time on LIDAR, which is a little easier to work with because I'd have to work about, worry about thermal noise and so forth. And then once we got figured out LIDAR, which is laser ranging, then they said, well, what about radar? Can't you do radar? I mean, you know, and so now I have to worry about thermal background noise and the different, the, a beam splitter is actually something called a hybrid, which only De uh, Nadav Kotz knows about. I don't know why I'm, I keep calling you David Katz. Is there a David Katz in your hand? I'm sure my, my late uncle. Okay, okay, okay. your late uncle. <laughs> he's come back. He's ghost. He's watching over us to make sure you be quiet too. Okay. So, uh, so this is this is the actual uh, picture from my proposal to DARPA. Okay, and we got like two million dollars out of this for theory uh, for for four years. There was actually $2.5 million for Ephraim Steinberg was going to do the experiment. I said, we don't want to experiment. <laughs> throw Steinberg out of here. We're just going to do the theory. Normally, they throw the theorist out and keep the experiment. And Steinberg has still not forgiven me. <laughs> uh, but the other person who hasn't forgiven me is Ned Allen pitched this idea to DARPA. 
And then he hoped Lockheed Martin would propose to DARPA and then he would collect his $2 million. So there were four winning themes. None of them was Ned Allen. To this day, he's bitter. He complains. His proposal was more than $2 million. It was more than yeah. You know this? So they were cheaper. Yeah. That's why. Yeah, we were cheaper. Faster, better, cheaper. Right, okay. So, uh, but we won with this graphic, exactly this graphic, $2 million graphic right here, done in PowerPoint, okay. And uh, we said, well, we're going to look at sending entangled photons through the atmosphere and see, we know what really the fraction limit is. And I said, this is completely nuts, but it'll take us $2 million. So, when I worked at NASA, there was always crazy guys at NASA headquarters with crazy ideas. So they came to me one time and said, we'll give you $50,000 to study using entangled photons to send messages faster than the speed of light. And I said, why would you? I, I go, well, I don't think that's going to work. Why, why do you need that? And he goes, well, you know, we're driving the rover on Mars, okay? And it's seven minutes out, seven minutes back. So I, it could go off a cliff, right? Cause, so it's more like they drive and then the rover responds only 14 minutes later. Do you know where the rover actually ended up? So he says, we'd really like to drive it in real time. So if we had an instantaneous communication system, that would be great. And I said, you cannot use entangled photons to send messages faster than the speed of light. And then they gave the 50K to somebody else. Okay. <laughs> so then I learned my lesson, okay? Same crazy NASA guy, he, he read this paper, and somebody else read the paper and said, can we use entangled photons to send ships to the star system Alpha Centauri, okay? And I go, what? <laughs> okay, 50K, and, and he go, I go, why would you want to do that? He goes, well, because when you send, there's this, Yuri Milner has this uh, program to send s ships to Alpha Centauri. Sails. So, yeah, they With have a sail, spaceships. like a boat with a mirror. But it's a little spaceship. It's a little yeah, spaceship. Yeah, but it has, it has a mirror sail, and everyone knows photon pressure pushes on things, right? And so if you have a big enough laser, you can push. The problem is, as you push this little ship, the laser beam gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so the number of photons per unit area drops off like one over R square-ish, and then so the, the thrust goes down. So if you had uh, a way to get around, and this is due to diffraction, right, okay? So if I, Rayleigh limit. So if I could go below the Rayleigh limit, when we could send these Alpha Centauri things, uh, you know, square root distance farther. So I learned my lesson from the <coughs> instantaneous communication system. I said, we gladly take the 50K. <laughs> and, so, and then I worked on something completely different for one year. And then I wrote a report. The title of the report was, can you use entangled photons to send light sail ships to Alpha Centauri? And the abstract said, no. <laughs> and we wrote two pages, why not? And I kept the 50K. Okay. You have to learn these lessons the hard way. So this is our winning proposal. But the idea was that you somehow, this is Ned Allen's idea. No, Ned Allen's idea was worse. Ned Allen's idea is we send both entangled photons to the, to, that's it, literally, to, to the missile. And then somehow, magically, we be, and so we immediately showed that doesn't work exactly for the same reason it doesn't work for the light-sailed ships. <laughs> All right. So the smart thing to do would be keep one half of your noon state in a delay line. <clears throat> now it's optical, so I can't just record it on a hard drive. The other half of the noon state goes to the missile. And then you come back and you beat the Rayleigh diffraction limit by lambda over n. And somehow, you get better target information. All right, so noon, m and M loss and love regained. So I misremembered my own paper. I'm, I'm thankful Professor Katz is here reading my papers, which I have not myself read since 2009, and then correcting what I said. So what we did is we said, OK, what we're going to do is we don't know is noon state the best because there's loss, a lot of loss due to fraction, atmospheric absorption. And noon states are very susceptible to loss. Why is that? This is a course that should I feel like I must write something on the chalkboard periodically to burn my teeth. All right. Sir Eisenberg the Quiet, live up to your new name. Okay. So, uh, 
Suppose we are sending an interferometer, because we have the magic beam splitter, the other magic beam splitter, and we have the new stick, right? So it's N0 plus 0 N. This is A, and this is B, this is A, and this is B. All right. And that's A mode and B mode. So suppose one of the photons scatters out due to loss. Like right, Professor Katz? Yes. He's on his phone. Okay. Suppose. suppose a photon scatters out due to loss, okay, and goes into the environment. Well, now the environment knows, and in quantum mechanics, the environment is just as good as a human being. This is why Schrodinger's cat is, you don't see macroscopic Schrodinger's cats. The photon is gone, okay? Well, it, it goes into this part of the environment, you know for sure it didn't come, this is A, it must have come from here, right? Because there is no photon in the A mode, okay? So you could not imagine the detector is here in the environment. If it goes click, it must have been this part of the nude state, because that's the only one that has photons in A, couldn't have been the other one. So it collapses the nude state, just like the collapses the cat. You know for sure it was this one and not that one, so it collapses to n minus 1 a and 0 b. The other part is gone. But it's that other part that gives you the interference and the multiple oscillations and the super sensitivity and the super resolution. So there's a trick you can play. You can do this. What we do is we do n minus 1. I'm going to borrow a photon and put it here. A, B, A, B. Why well, I'm borrowing this photon to protect me against the loss, okay? So we call these M and M states. We have M and M prime, because you might borrow two, okay? The more you borrow, the worse the resolution and the worse the sensitivity, but the better the resistance to loss, okay? But let's just look at one. Now, the uh, gremlin, what is Hebrew for gremlin? Gremlin. Shed. Shed? Shed. Demon. Demon? Shed. Shed. Shed? Shed. Shed is a demon. Shed. Okay, there's a shed in the environment. He's inside of a shed with a detector. Okay, now if he gets a click. Shedding tears. Shedding tears. Okay. Now if he gets a click, he's not sure if it was this guy or this guy. Okay? So one click does not destroy the noon state. This guy or this guy? Yeah, I'm sorry, this guy or this guy, right. So one click does not destroy the noon state, and you end up with n minus 1, 0, 0, n minus 1. So you lose a photon, but you sacrifice that photon, so shed in the shed, shed in tears. Isn't it n minus 2, 1, and 0, n minus 1? You're, you're missing a photon. So it's one of the sides. Only one photon is missing. Yes, so it, it should be n minus 2. 1 ah, yeah, okay, plus yeah, yeah, yeah. 0 n minus 1 okay. because it's always from the same Exactly, side. okay. So you're, you're missing up, yeah. So this is this goes down by 1 n minus 2. Yeah. Okay. But you see the point. I'm, I'm fooling the shed in the shed, shedding the tears uh, by hiding an extra photon. So I can keep playing this game, add more guys here, and then I could lose two photons. If I made it n minus 2, 2, I could lose two photons and I still don't collapse it. But the more I add into the immunity for loss, the sensitivity and resolution gets worse. So there's a trade-off, okay? And we call these M&M &M states. And I tried to publish this, and then the PRA said, uh, you have to get permission for M&M &M candy and to use their logo. And uh, that was the end of that. Okay. But if you use just one photon to protect, if you look at, at the entropy, the, your shed will know in high probability which uh, which one of them was it? It's only a partial protection. It's only a partial it's protection. Really, really little protection if you use. <coughs> but you have to remember, I, I, the shed actually. There's no shed. This is an environment, so there's no. I just trace over that mode, so that gets rid of the. No, but what he's saying, your n minus one more likely to emit from the n side of it versus the one. Right, right, right. So, so, so the probabilities are no longer half. No, no, of course. It's always from the n minus one. 
It's either here or there. There's always an Yeah, it's okay, but your probabilities are no longer half after the click. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, but so your 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 noon state is. Only partially. Remember, remember, I set the square root of two equal to one, so I'm not arguing about the factors of half. Okay. The, the, the point is that you can see intuitively that if there's, you add this additional photon, it protects against loss. But only so far. So for this, you've got the image which is up to an n minus This is the limit of the 2 dB. That's it. If, if, if somebody lets me go, I will, that's on the next slide. Okay. Okay. That's the whole point. So what we did is we said we're going to send every possible combination of two photon entangled states, noon, M and M, and we, we put it in a genetic algorithm, and the genetic algorithm searches through all possible two-mode digital quantum states, and in each dB, you're right, six, I can't even quote my own paper, okay? So, the, and then the algorithm finds the best state, okay? So here is loss, okay, so here's, the, here's our system. And what we do is we just try all possible different combinations of sources, and you know, N and M and N and all what of this. What is the y-axis? What is the y, uh, this is the... Uh, Projection, what does it mean? This is the overlap with the, uh, uh, no, this is not the, this is the, this is the, uh, the loss. This is the. This is the. In some units, it's the sensitivity. The, the one delta pi, one over the square root of n. Okay. So more is better or less is better? Uh, more, more is, is better. better. Yeah. Okay. So why the MNM go, goes higher with loss? Because it starts beating the known state. Right. No, at the beginning you have more loss and the and, the, and it, it gets better. Also the so, GPCS. Why don't I explain it and then you ask the question as opposed to you ask the question and then I explain it. Does that uh, time Good. ordering? Is it? Good. Okay. So at zero loss, it finds noon state is best, which I have analytical proof saying that there's no loss, it's best. And M and M's don't you do any good at zero loss. It's finding the optimal state. The M and M is not optimal. That's typically it's optimizing. So M and M does okay, but it's not optimal. And then the optimal states start being this M and M here, okay? And they go up for a while. But this one here, this is GPCS, it's a, it's a coherent state. I don't have an infinite number of photons, so it's not a true coherent state because they fix the photon number, but it has a high overlap with the coherent state. So around 6 dB, this is exactly what you asked. I said three, Katz is right. I, Three is equal to six. I, I got my own paper wrong. Around it's six. About field and intensity. Yeah, yeah. The the, the coherence. Engineers and physicists. Yeah. But the a factor of two. You know. Well, I never. I don't. Losses in power. The DB is powers. for the engineering department. Okay. No offense. Uh, but in any case, around six dB, uh, the coherence state is always best. You don't do any better for sensitivity. This is phase phase measurement. Okay. Phase measurement is always best uh, uh, for a coherency. So phase sensitivity is the important metric I learned from you when you have lots of photons, okay? So uh, it's kind of consistent that if you have lots of photons, you just use a coherent state and no quantum tricks will help you. So that was the conclusion is that and the loss that DARPA gave us was like 113 dB. And I said, well, we're not gonna win with this. Okay. So, and you can see this is the computer code. There's an inverse problem. So you, you, you have $2 million, you have to spend it on something, right? So we bought computer time, and we had the uh, computer guys running this thing day and night, and they were very impressed, okay? But the result is after 6 dB, you should just use it. Sending and tangled out and back doesn't give you range information. Now, quantum illumination, I'm not going to talk about. It's a different can of worms. But in terms of range uh, uh, information, uh, you might as well just use coherent state. So entanglement does not help. Can I ask my question for before? It's still standing? Oh, okay, okay. Why are the M and M's getting better with loss? The parameter is still getting better. I would expect them to decay like noon. So, Maybe decay slower, but decay. So it's finding the, okay, I can't even read the axis here, okay. It's taking the state that it finds with the optimal state and somehow overlapping. So this is the overlap of the optimal state that it finds and the state that we know that should be optimal. So it's, it's a funny graph, okay? okay. So M&M's, it's, it's not, this is, 
There are M and M states that do pretty good, but they're not the same M and M state. That's the point. It's finding different M and M states at each red point. It's not the same one. Mm -hmm. But they're still getting better, even at beyond six dB. Yeah, they but keep climbing up. No, well, no. Start to go down again. I, we don't. The computer coughs out, but the new ones go, and the M and M's go back down again too. All right. So notice I have 6 dB, 10 dB now. The 10 is equal to 3. Okay, so if it's greater than 6 dB, use the coherent states. And uh, so that's the take home message from this calculation. Uh, and you've already know this plug the unused port. Okay. So. Aha. Okay, but so your simulation only had 10 photons in it max, right? Uh, I so think 10 dB is uh, a little flaky to no, look at. No, him, no, right? no, you're we, left with less than a no, no. We had higher than 10. This is 10 dB here. Yeah, but how many photons did you have? I, I remember 10. 20, 30, 40, oh, 50, 20, 30, something 30. like that. Two million dollars. Yeah, well, you know, exactly. We we took it higher than than what we expected to need. All right. So this is a recap. If I send in any state here, if I send in vacuum, I never do better than the shot noise limit. Okay. But super resolving, you can do. Remember, shot noise is 1 over square root of n versus 1 over n. That's out. Okay. But lambda versus lambda over n, that's still in the game. Okay. So this is just some recap of people doing super resolution. So I went back and looked. This record is Andrew White, 6, okay, where he just uses coherent states and projects into the noon basis. This next one is Silverberg, 5. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. So set super sensitivity, worse than shot noise, but super resolution is still in the game. All right. So we proposed this idea. We said, okay, let me go back to this picture here. <coughs> so it doesn't do any good to send the tangled light out to this, uh, the target and back again after 6 dB. Okay? There's nothing, no, no sort of entanglement trick is going to work. So the idea is now, let's to focus on the detection scheme, which here is some sort of joint uh, coincidence count or something like this, and see if there's something quantum we can do in the detector. We send the coherent light out, coherent light back. We know they can't do any better uh, uh, with entanglement. But then we do tricks in the detector to try to improve the resolution. We can't do the sensitivity, but resolution is still in the game. And there's a range where the resolution is the important metric when you get very, the target is far away, or very small, or stealth target. Okay. So the idea then is, okay, to look at this, and then we say, I want to look at why a noon state is interesting. Okay. And so we do parity measurement. Remember, we're doing the parity measurement here, even or odd. Okay. I want to know what exactly is the optimal state just before I hit the beam splitter for resolution. Okay. Now, the optimal state, uh, uh, one of the optimal states is, no, I want to know what the optimal detection scheme, ah, there we go, okay. So I want to know what the optimal detection scheme is just before I hit this first beam splitter, okay. So the idea is we play around with this and we come up with a detection scheme that's located here, okay, and that looks like this. I'm not going to go into any detail. But if you take this crazy thing and you pass it through the final beam splitter, you get parity. So this is actually a proof that parity is optimal. Okay? Some details are down here. So the point is, is that we're after super resolution. So if you're in the detection scheme and you use the parity measurement, you get fringes, that features that are below the Rayleigh <coughs> diffraction limit. So here is the Rayleigh diffraction limit is red. Okay. And that blue and green, okay, this is, this is uh, I forget what the purple is, but you can see you're getting narrower and narrower features, okay. So you don't get, you don't get lambda over n white, but you get lambda over the square root of n bar, okay. So, and this is the return number of photons. So it, a lot, no, a lot, delta. I'm just going to say a lot. It's secret cryptographic. Uh, uh, this is a hundred. This is several hundred. Okay, so you can beat the Rayleigh diffraction limit by a factor of ten or something like this, 
in a regime where the reflected uh, radiation has only a few number of photons. Okay, that's what this narrow feature is supposed to be. But do you really prove that it's a parity or just numerically find it? No, we prove. This, that, I'm, I'm not going to go into it because it's a long and tedious proof where I begin putting in different possible combinations of the density matrix and analyzing and then we optimize it and then we show that we find an optimal detection scheme to the left of the beam splitter and we transform it through the beam splitter using the beam splitter transformations and we get parity. So this is a proof that parity is optimal. And we already kind of knew parity was optimal because it hits the quantum Kramer route now, which I'm going to talk about next week. But this is more of an intuitive, I don't know, it depends on your, how much you like math. Okay. So I'm not, not going through this in too much detail. What, the, is, what is the in, thinking about when n is then huge? So then it's becoming a uh, become limit to... Right. So when n is huge, then, well, there's no real advantage. You might as well just use coherent states. Coherent. Yeah, you, you're not going to be able to... The larger n is, the more susceptible it is to loss. So this is that, not something that I've discussed. But the, the, the noon states have an extra... intuition for this. Why it's happening? Yeah. Intuition. Ah, that's overrated. A guy, can you turn on the light again? <laughs> oh, I have a nice poopy brown one here. Okay, so there's N, and then we got a zero. For the poop state. For the poop state. Okay, this is not the poop state. Then we have E to the I, N phi. So this is the thing that I haven't drawn yet. Let's do that now. And this is always A, B, A, B, so I'm going to stop writing it. So this is a thing that gives you the multiple oscillations, the fast oscillations. When you project this onto the parity operator, you get, instead of cosine phi, you get cosine n phi, so it wiggles n times as fast, okay? The problem with the noon state is, is that if I do now, I can do a very simple calculation. Let's suppose phi has some fluctuations. Now, I'm just going to do the dephasing argument. I already gave you the argument for the loss. If the loss, if one photon goes, you're dead, okay? It's also the same for de uh, decoherence. If I have phi and then I add some plus or minus delta phi, okay? If this is a random variable with zero mean and you expand it out, you get this is equal to e to the i n phi e to the minus one half n squared delta phi. Word. So if you have any sort of decoherence or fluctuations, the noon state decays n squared exponentially faster. The singles decay at e to the minus one half delta phi squared. But that kills you. So as n gets larger, you die quickly in multiple different possible depths. And you never end up in the beach house in Malibu. <laughs> Maybe you do faster. Well, yeah, <laughs> the Zeno effect. Okay, so the, the point is is that we, we, we calculate this term by term. I go through and add everything in, always optimizing the resolution, and I get this is the operator, the detection operator you should use here, and then Gao, who is my student, I gave up at this point. I said, Gao, transform this through the beam splitter. What do you get? He comes back and goes, parity. Gao is a Chinese guy, he's student. He only speaks in one or two words. Syllables. Yeah, yes, no. So I, when we wrote this paper up, I said, look, I'm going to write the paper, you check the math, and then you're going to retype it in LaTeX, because I don't do LaTeX, I have students do LaTeX. My Chinese students are graphical user interfaces for LaTeX, okay? So I said, check the math and do it in LaTeX. So it's very easy, it's all word, okay? So he brings it back and he goes, here's the paper. And I go, did you check the math? Yes. Did you find any mistakes? Surprisingly, no. And I go, surprisingly? <laughs> and then he thinks, no. <laughs> yeah, one too many words. Surprisingly, no. Okay. All right, so the point is, this is uh, somebody sitting in the room, Professor Haggai Eisenberg, oh, quiet, and somebody else sitting in the room is now my postdoc, okay. What's and, and, and Daria. And then you're here. And Lior, uh, not, what, what, Liat? Liat. Liat. Lior, Liat. I actually confused you at one point. I, I didn't know who was Lior and who was Liat. What is she doing? Intel. Intel? Quantum lithography. 
<laughs> they Great. the billions. So, she's, so maybe I'll visit her in her house in Malibu. Okay. But he, here, instead of using, they implement the parity operator using uh, photon number resolving detectors, even or odd. He's, you, you heard this, parity says it's one, it's odd, two, it's even. If it's one plus three plus five plus seven, that's still parity odd. If it's two plus four plus six, it's parity even. And so the parity measurement, we just showed it's optimal to implement parity. And, and once again, you see these narrower and narrower features. So this is the classical is the black one here, I think. And then as you increase the photon number and the return signal, you get narrow and narrow. Why do I want a narrow signal? So I have something coming at me, uh, a bird with explosives on it, moving at Mach 10. Okay. Angry bird. An angry bird. They explode. They <laughs> okay, fine. An angry bird moving at Mach 10. And I want to lock onto the narrowest feature that I can find, which is now moving because it's a, a radar system or a LIDAR system. And then I, I, I get the position, R of D, but I want also derivative, R dot V of D, and double dot acceleration because I need the velocity and the acceleration to know where it will be so I can shoot it down with I and go. Okay? That's, the, that's what we're talking about. So the, they have a new laser system now. You do? It was on the news yesterday. Oh, okay. Well, we had discussed that before. Well, we can make it quantum, okay. So the, but the, <laughs> the point is, is the narrower the feature. Under kilowatt. The, yeah, because each time you take a derivative, you know when you integrate, things get smoother. But when you derivate, that's not really a word, things get more noisy. So you want this to be as accurate as possible so that you can predict where the thing will be. So we per, the problem is photon number counting is hard to do in radar because the the number counters were best in the optical as the wavelength, he's taking notes, yeah. unlike you. Uh, as the wavelength gets longer and longer and longer, the energy of the photon gets less and less and less, and the detectors go click because h bar omega energy has hit them. But for radar, this h bar omega is below the, the band gap in most materials. It's, you can't make a photon number resolving detector yet in radar. So, but what they, everybody in radar loves is heterodyne and homodyne. And so it turns out you can actually compute the parity, uh, uh, calculate the parity from doing homodyne measurement. And the homodyne measurements just think, says I take the laser or the radar beam, I beat it against the local oscillator, I do some additional math, and then I extract the parity. And the parity is the signal that I want. So here's the idea here. We came up with, Agar it was actually Agarwal's idea. He goes, Parity is the integral function at the origin. You can do that with the homodyne. So, but it ain't your grandma's homodyne. I'm just saying, particularly your grandma. Okay, so the idea now. Let's go back. This is crazy net. This is not even crazy net Allen's. This is this is our version of crazy net. Send entangled light to the target. That's not going to work. Loss, dephasing, everything's going to kill you very very fast. So send classical light to the target and do something quantum on the, on the detection side, okay? And the answer is parity. Do parity measurement and implement that with photon number resolving detectors. Ah, yeah. That's just this. I'm going through. This is how you do the parity measurement using homodyne. It's a little boring. I'm running out of time. But the bottom line is either with number resolving detectors or this way you get the narrow features. Ah, but this is important for Nissan. So this is uh, uh, one of the things that when you're measuring a target, in order to, you need three-dimensional information. It's R vector, right? I need to know how far it is, what angle, and I forget which one is this? Azimuth. And what is that? Elevation. Elevation, okay. I need both angle, elevation. Are you registered for the class? Sorry. Are you taking pictures of the slides? Yeah. All the slides are in the folder available to all the students <laughs> who are registered for the class. So if you just stuff. read your damn email and then pay attention. Okay. It's, like, it's like he's got all the slides are online. Okay. So the point is, is that uh, this is the discussion we were having today with... Where is Leonid? Leonid is not here. The beam splitter is in the sky, right? The first beam splitter, okay? So you have this thing coming in, and this is your elevation. Elevation, right? You would like to use the same trick. And range information, distance apparently, I'm told, is easy, but elevation and the, the uh, uh, azimuthal angle are hard. 
So what you do is you put your two detectors here, okay, and you're getting the coherent light, and it's just like two slit diffraction. The light has to travel slightly farther here than it does here, and you can convert that into an angle, and that gives you your elevation, which is the harder thing to get. You run it through another beam splitter, which we now know is a hybrid. A hybrid what? I don't know, but CAT still is a hybrid, and they make this in radio waves. And then you do the quantum homodyne, which is just homodyne with some additional features, and you get a very narrow peak, but that narrow peak now is the resolution of the angle, not of the distance, which is what you guys want. Okay. So, I, I'm almost done. Ah, good. So the, um, uh, the final st uh, uh, step here is that a guy's group did it with the photon number resolving detectors, but you can't do that in radar, you want to do homodyne. So they did this with homodyne. So this is a group in Denmark. And again, all of and the guy taking the photos, the, the slides and the references are in the folder available to all registered <coughs> students who read the damn email. Okay, okay, fine. With the link. Ah, okay, so the point is they get this one over, they use N, but it's N bar, mean number of photons. So there's the setup, uh, and in comes, this is the alpha coming in, they mix it, there's a phase shifter. So all of this is the sky in some sense, right? This phase shift is the path length difference between the two uh, 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 phase, uh, between the two paths that the, the radar is coming in. And that's the second beam splitter, which is, the, is the, the hybrid, okay? And then they do an output measurement here. And I, I guess this is the local oscillator. I'm a little confused by this. But you can see that there are these oscillations in this phase space plane, and all of these blobs, there's no squeezing, they're all coherent. But you get, yeah, this is alpha cosine theta over two, and now uh, phi over two, and phi over two there. Bottom line, you get this. They don't do uh, parity. Parity, we spent, okay, could you turn the light back on? Make yourself useful for once. For the 10th time. For the 10th time. So th they don't use parity because parity, the, the not your grandma's homodyne is a little bit complicated. And they said, well, what we're going to do is do a, a, a binning. So it looks like the parity operator. But the parity operator has a whole bunch of terms. They just take two terms, okay? And they bin it here or there. It's like a binary measurement. It's easier to do. It's not optimal because parity is optimal. This is not parity. But it's pretty good. And it gives you the right features. So their expectation value looks like this. So let's see how that works. So if I have a Gaussian, right, e to the minus x squared over sigma squared, right, that looks like this, right? This is x is equal to zero. And the width is on the order of sigma, correct? That's a Gaussian, right? So this thing is also a Gaussian. Let me write it in a suggestive way. Let's suppose the angle is small just for a second. So that's minus one half. Sine squared uh, of phi is just going to be phi squared. Okay. And then I take n. That n is, in, they use n, but it's n bar. I flip that upside down. Okay. So then I get one over n bar. Okay. Square root squared. Okay. And so sigma is equal to 1 over the square root of n bar, which is my return signal. Photons, hundreds, hundreds of photons. What did you say yesterday, Nissan, 600 photons? Yeah. So I get an improvement of 1 over the square root of 600, which is pretty good. All right, so here's the data. This is the classical thing here. This is uh, n bar is 19. n bar is equal to 132. Notice how much, and again, the narrower the feature, the better I can lock on to, the better I can get x, uh, x dot, and x double dot, and know where it will be, and shoot it, okay? And so, if I put Nissan's number, 600, this would be like a delta function, and that's the promise of this whole thing. I have a delta function-like feature that I'm tracking with the missile that I can use to extract the range, angle, and all the information I need. In our experiment that you showed the results, we had up to 4,000, and average up to 4,000. 
year. You just had it like 10, five ago. Oh, okay. So it went up to 4,000. Right. I mean, the only I, I love your scheme, but until the Chinese invent the photon number resolving detector in the, in the radar range, mm -hmm. we're stuck with Omanine. What really limits you is not the detector here, but the uh, visibility of your interferometer, of your interference. You can go to higher numbers and get better resolution, but what really limits you is the visibility of the interferometer. Because you saw the sensitivity has this annoying peak in the center, yeah. which actually ruins you. So the, the